Praise God. You may be seated. Hallelujah. You know, it's funny. We're going to talk a little bit about the Holy Ghost. Like Pastor Kevin was sharing about the things of the Holy Spirit and the anointing and the transference of anointing. It's so tangible. The Holy Ghost is, continues to move through us. If God would open up our spiritual eyes and reveal it, you, you would see. You would see the Holy Ghost. You would see the angels around us. You would see it. But it's one thing to see it, and it's one thing to know it, that he's here. It's one thing to know that his presence is here. Because his presence is here regardless if we can see it, if we can sense it, we must know for a fact that he's here. What I'm going to share with you guys tonight is I'm going to talk about a woman by the name of Catherine Coleman. How many remember Catherine Coleman? Praise God. I'm telling you, when I study these characters, they, some of them just really stand out to me of what, how God uses them. And she was very, very, had a strong, strong relationship. Some of those that know her have a strong relationship with the Holy Ghost. And you know what? The Holy Ghost wants to have that strong relationship with you. You know, he is here, and he wants to have that relationship with you. He wants to be able to talk with you. He wants to be able to share things that he's hearing from heaven and reveal them to you. Amen. Let's go to uh, John chapter 16. John 16, and we're going to look at verse, start in verse 7. Say, thank God for the word. It's here where Jesus talks to his disciples, and he begins to share with them that he's getting ready to leave. And then, of course, in the scripture, it says that sorrow began to fill their heart because they didn't want to leave Jesus. They didn't want Jesus to leave them. But Jesus was talking to them and letting them know that it's beneficial for you that I go. Because if I do not go, then my Father cannot send the promise. And the promise is the Holy Ghost. So we're going to look at it, pick it up here in verse 7. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come... He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. In verse 8, And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, Jesus is speaking, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you. Say, he will guide me. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak to you. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. For he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. That is the purpose of the Holy Ghost. And what Catherine Coleman demonstrated to us is that it is possible to have a deep personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. You know, it was very evident because a lot of people say that they called her the, uh, the American witch at times. They called her the American witch. They said that, that she had a devil in her. Well, you guys also remember too, is they also thought that Jesus had a devil in him. 
See, but the outside world could not see. But Jesus says, but you know me. Now, the Holy Ghost himself is always present. And she began to step into some things because she invested time in her relationship with the Holy Ghost. See, it's when we invest time in the Holy Ghost that we get to understand, we get to hear, and we get to become what the Bible calls us is he becomes our comforter, our helper in our time of need. We all want that relationship with the Holy Ghost. And it just so happens that Catherine Coleman, not saying that she was the greatest person, because she even said it in her life. She says this. She says, I know that I was not the first one that, that God called. I wasn't even the second choice. I probably wasn't even the third choice. I'm just the one that listened to him. Could it be that the Holy Ghost has been speaking to us so many times in our life that we can avoid so many errors, that we can avoid so many problems in our life, if we would just open up our spiritual ears and open up our hearts so that we can hear the Holy Ghost as he begins to speak to us, that we can also experience this type of relationship that she walked in. That's me. I want to. Every day I want to. But it's also an investment. And it's not to say that Catherine Coleman, that, that, she, that she was... She was powerfully used by God. Of course, she was used by God. But just like all of us, we are human beings and we make mistakes and we fail. And we're going to look at some things in her life. We're going to start off a little bit from her beginning. We're going to start off and look at some things that she went through as a child. Now, it says that in the beginning, when Catherine Coleman, she had such a great relationship with her father. Her father was a man that when he would come home, she would wrap her, herself around his leg and he'd kind of carry her around the house. How many fathers have had their daughters do that, right? And, and it, it, touches your, it touches their heart and it touches you, your heart as a father. Well, her father, it says that in her story is that she just developed this powerful relationship with God, this relationship of God that she can love God with her whole heart because of her relationship with her father. So it's important as us fathers to also recognize gifts in our own children and lead them in the way that they should go. And because she had this great relationship with her father and her father just poured out love to her, well, it wasn't so easy on the other side because on her mother, her mother was more of the disciplinary, the disciplinary one inside the house. Well, and usually in a lot of families, usually the mothers are, right? And it just so happened is that she went to the extreme. Let me share a story. Catherine was, uh, wanted to do something nice for her mother. And back in those days, see, the women dressed all week long. They got themselves fixed up with the makeup, the war paint, whatever you want to call it. But they got so fixed up inside themselves, they dressed up the whole week just in case company came over because they didn't want to be undignified or kind of look, you know, I'm all scruffy and different things going on. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like today, right? And what happened is that Catherine realized that her mother's birthday was coming up. And so she went to all the neighbors, and she said, you know what, my mom's birthday's coming up. Why don't you guys bake me a cake and get this cake and just come over to the house and let's celebrate my mom's birthday. Let's give her a surprise party. Everybody get together. And she invited all the neighborhood and all the people around to come to the house. Well, she never talked to her mother about this. She wanted to do it in her own heart. Well, it just so happens that Mama's birthday fell on Monday, and it just so happens that Monday was wash day. So you can already see the story. Mama was not in her, not in her dress clothes or ready, ready to go. She was like some of us when we do our wash, our wash day, you know, we're in our cutoff short, you know, we're in our, our, our slippers and our different things, and our hair is falling over, you're sweating, your, your clothes are dirty. Well, there was a knock on the door. And as soon as mama opened up the door, 
She saw the whole neighborhood there with her cakes, and they said, happy birthday. Well, you can already imagine what Mama did. Mama looked down. She looked at Catherine, and she says, I will get you for this. And the whole neighborhood saw her, and it was that the punishment that Mama did come back and get her because she said that with all the cakes that were delivered to Mama, she made Catherine stand there and eat every single cake to teach her a lesson. So Mama was a big disciplinarian. Now, Daddy, on the other hand, was more of a softy, right? It's kind of like me. I'm a softy. Amen. Somebody needs to pray for the... No, okay. It says that Catherine, Col Catherine Coleman, the woman some had worshipped as the perfect Madonna, was actually a human being subject to human temptations. She was a great woman of God, but what made her great was her choice and her actions to recover from her mistakes. In her ministry, she started off young. It says that in, in, her, in her story that she got saved at the age of 14 years old. She got born again. They were not religious people. They were just had a religious background where they went to church when kind of like uh, on Easter or on Christmas, right? And, and it just so happens is that Daddy was a Baptist, but Mama was a Methodist, okay? Catherine got born again at the age of 14 years old. And during that conversion, when she gave her life to the Lord Jesus Christ, she broke down and she cried because she had realized at the age of 14 years old that she had been a sinner. And she turned her life over to the Lord. So let's go ahead and begin. It says, Catherine Johanna Coleman was born on May 9, 1907 in Concordia, Missouri. Her parents were the names Emma and Joseph, which were what they were Germans, and she was one of four children. Her mother was a harsh disciplinarian who showed little love or affection. On the other hand, she had an extremely close and loving relationship with her father. She would describe as a small child how her father would come home from work and she would hang on his leg and begin to cling to him. She often said that her relationship with God the Father was extremely real because of her relationship with her own father, even though she did not know if her own father had been born again or not. According to Catherine, the discipline was always left to her mother, which it says in the story that she was a very harsh woman who never praised Catherine or gave her any affection, yet she never felt unloved or unwanted because of the love that she received from Papa. It says that young Catherine was 14 when she was born again. At an evangelical meeting, it was held in a small Methodist church. She received the Lord Jesus Christ had come into her life. In her young life, it says that when she was 16, she had graduated from high school. See, back in these, these years, uh, high school only went up to only went up to 10th grade, and then you had graduated high school. I wish that happened now, praise God. Which only went to 10th grade in her town. Her older sister, Myrtle, had married an evangelist named Everett B. Parrott. They spent their time traveling, and they had asked if Catherine could join them for the summer. Her parents agreed, and she went to Oregon to help out. She worked with them and often gave her testimony at these meetings. When the summer was over, she wanted to stay. She didn't want to come back home. She enjoyed the life that was out there in those evangelic meetings because God was already showing her what she was going to be doing. She didn't want to come home. And if you're like a 16-year-old kid and you go away from home and you haven't been away from home, you want to stay out there a little bit longer. Amen. And it says that she came home and she began to talk to her mother and she began to talk to her father and they gave her permission to continue on. It says when the summer was over and of course her brother-in-law and, brother and her sister agreed, 
She ended up working them in their ministry for five years. It was at this point that God had begun to work inside of her life and to begin to show her things. The, anv- the anv- evangelist team was made up of four people. It was made up of Everett. It was made up of Myrtle, his, his wife, Catherine, and a piano player named Helen Guilford. It says in 1928, Everett missed a meeting in Boise, Idaho due to some marital problems. So Myrtle and Catherine preached to cover the cover for Everett, who would go on to South Dakota. It was at this point where it says that, that times began to be very, very tough. Because of this marital problem that they were experienced between his, her brother-in-law and her sister, he took off and went to another meeting to kind of ease the tension. He took off, they stayed. But as they were covering and they were ministering in those evangelical meetings, um, the offerings became very, very low. Now, if you, had a, if you had a meeting and you didn't collect the offerings, that's what they needed to, to go ahead and pay rent. That's what they needed to buy things. Well, if there was no money, guess what? No money, no meeting. They collected very, very little meeting. They were not they didn't have enough money to go ahead and pay rent. So they were struggling. Sometimes we go through struggles too, but we don't give up. We continue to move on, right? One thing about Catherine, she knew that God was a big God and God's resources no man can touch. And what it is is that Catherine and, and Myrtle, they began to talk about it, knowing that they didn't have anything. So what she did is Myrtle decided to go with her husband on the road. She took off and she went with him and Catherine stayed by herself and with the piano player, Helen. And it says that as they were staying there, because the money was so low and they weren't collecting that many big offerings, they barely had enough to buy a loaf of bread, and they were living off bread and tuna. I've eaten worse. It says, so Myrtle decided to go rejoin her husband, and it was here that a local pastor in Boise, Idaho, encouraged Catherine to step out on her own and offered her a chance to preach. I wanted to share one thing. In the midst of adversity, if we would continue to keep our eyes on the Lord. See, some of us would have said, oh, hold on, Myrtle's leaving, she's taking off, she's going back with her husband, we're not making any money here, I I don't know what we're going to do. But no, Catherine was determined. She was following God. She knew that that was God's will for her life. And sometimes when we get discouraged, what we do is we tend to want to take off and run. No, you stick it out. You stick it out. God is faithful. You stick it out. Even when it looks tough. Even when things don't look like they're going to, doesn't make any sense. Bills are not being met. I I, I can't do this. I, I don't know what to do. Stick it out. We walk by faith, not by sight. If we're going to walk this walk, then let's walk this walk. Let's believe God. And let's call those things that be not as though they are. Amen. And it said, even at this moment when Myrtle had took off and she had left to be with her husband, an opportunity arose. Say opportunity. If she would have left and went back home, the opportunity would have never arose for her and we would not be talking about Catherine Coleman today. It says that there was a local pastor who had given her an opportunity. He heard her testimony. He heard her minister the word. And he gave her an opportunity. Thank God for small beginnings. He gave her a beginning to go ahead and just preach. And what, how when she would preach, she would just share her testimony. And whatever God put on her heart. Well, apparently that was enough because what he heard, he gave her an opportunity. Because she was sincere. And you can see when somebody really trusts God. It says that Helen agreed to join her. So now what it is, it's Catherine, and now it's her piano player. Praise God. Us too? That's fine. Me and you and the Holy Ghost. That's all we need. It says her first sermon was in a rundown pool hall in Boise, Idaho. The team covered Idaho, they covered Utah, and they covered Colorado for the following five years. Just that small opportunity opened the door for her to continue to minister the word and continue to be used by God for another five years. 
See, we need to be thankful for small beginnings. When doors open unto us, be thankful. We have two people that we're preaching to. We'll praise God for the two. Let's get them saved and move on. Amen. They, there could be our elders in our church. Praise God. Let's go out there and get more. But let's continue to be faithful and stay on the road that God has placed us on. It says that they, they had actually uh, set up. So they were traveling through Idaho, Utah, Colorado for the following five years. Then in 1933, they moved into Pueblo, Colorado. They set up in an abandoned Montgomery Ward's warehouse, and they stayed there for another six months. As they were traveling along, see, God was already building faith inside of Catherine. Yes, we know Catherine Cohen to be this, this woman who had such a, uh, a special relationship with the Holy Ghost. See that even in some of her meetings and even in some of her services, a lot of times she didn't even have to preach the word. It's just the Holy Spirit just being in those services. Some, somebody would stand up and say, I'm healed. I just got healed because it's being in his presence. No words were spoken. Nobody laid hands on the people. People were just receiving healing, just being in the presence of God, kind of like you are tonight, just sitting in his presence. If you would put your faith out there, and you would believe God for that healing, no matter what the, what the circumstance is or what situation you're going through, the presence of God is all you need. And that's what happened in Catherine Coleman's meetings. See, but God was teaching Catherine great faith. Here it is that she had a small beginning, but even through those small beginnings, God was continuing to work with her and to teach her to exercise her faith and to stretch out. It says that with only $5 in their name, Catherine told a gentleman by the name of Earl F. Hewitt, who became her business manager, to go into Denver and act as though you had a million dollars. You know, my pastor back home, he'd say, you know what? Sometimes you need to fake it till you make it. You know, she had $5, and she said, you know what? You go into Denver, because Denver was a big place, even though they only had $5 at the time in their pocket, but you know what? You walk in faith and you pretend like you have a million dollars. And see, Catherine had a big vision from God. She says, I want you to find a big place. I want you to fill it up with chairs and make sure that you have a nice piano to play. And so they booked a place in Denver with $5 in their pocket. It says that God is not limited, this is her quote, God is not limited by what we have or who we are. Find the biggest building you can. Get the finest piano and fill it with chairs. And she said, this is God's business. And we're going to do it God's way. And when we do it God's way, we're going to do things big. That's the way that we need to have. We need to think that way. Anytime we get ready to do something for God, we need to know that God is a big God. He's the one that supplies our every need according to his riches and glory. It's not me. All I need to do is my job. And as long as I do my job, and as long as I'm obedient to the call of God, all I have to do is make plans because God is going to provide. And they went into town with $5, and they got this big building with chairs and a piano with $5. How great is your faith? Now, Denver, being a much bigger city, was the next stop. It says they moved several times, but ended up in a paper company's warehouse. Yes, yeah, so they went from meeting to meeting as they were growing, which they named the Catherine Revival Tabernacle. Then in 1935, they moved once more to a, an abandoned truck garage that they named the Denver Revival Tabernacle. Catherine was seeing a lot of success in Denver. She began a radio show called Smiling Through and invited speakers from all over the country. One of them was Phil Kerr, who taught on divine healing, and another evangelist named Burles Waltrip. But before I go into that, I want to share this with you guys. Is that Catherine Coleman, in her ministry, she had been faithful to the things of God. She was not married. 
She didn't have children. She wasn't thinking that way. She was a woman that was being used by God. And God was working things out through her. Her heart was, was salvations. She wanted everybody to be saved. That was her heart. You can say that she was maybe melodramatic at times, but that was her heart. She wanted to touch. If you guys remember the teaching on Amy Simple McPherson, that's how Amy Simple McPherson was. But Catherine Coleman would walk around, and here is this woman in a white dress, a little dangly white dress, and she spoke with boldness. She wasn't a very attractive woman. It says that she was a redhead with freckles, stood about five foot eight, and was a little lanky. But God still used her mightily. And the Lord began to use her small beginnings, and he began to build her up and build her up and build her up, where she was obeying God, and God was bringing more increase. I'm following God, and God is bringing more increase. Yes, they move from meeting to building, meeting, building to building, but as long as that you're following God, I'm building up, and I'm continuing to grow, and I'm continuing to grow. And she built up this ministry in Denver, and it says that she had a lot of success there. There were a lot of salvations that were coming through her ministry. This next part that I'm going to share is it reaches all of us because we are not perfect people, but we serve a perfect God. And we too make mistakes. And even though we make mistakes, sometimes we are our worst critics. We condemn ourselves. If you have made a mistake, repent from it, get up, and move on. If we continue to stay there, then we will stop the flow of God in our life. It will stop God's flow with what he really wants to do with us. Think about it. God already knows that we make mistakes. But if our heart is perfect and right towards him, even when we make mistakes, he says that I'm faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Son, daughter, get up, move on. But it's to say that each and every one of us are fallible. And Catherine Coleman was no different. This next segment that I'm going to share with you was she had met a man. Now, Catherine wasn't, as it wasn't married. She didn't have any children. And it, even, it didn't even look like she was going that way. Because God was just using her and using her and using her. Well, she had a bump in the road. And it's called the lust of the flesh. It says she met a gentleman, an evangelist named Burroughs Waltrip, or you can say her nickname for him was Mr. It says Waltrip was bad news for Coleman. He was a charismatic, handsome man, several years older than she was. There was an immediate attraction. But he was married and had two children. Waltrip left Denver. He went home to Austin, Texas, and shortly afterwards, he went and he divorced his wife, and he abandoned his two sons. He then spread the story that his wife had left him. He moved to Mason City, Iowa, where he told everyone that he was single because his wife had abandoned him. And he started eventually a ministry there. It says there must have been an ongoing relationship with Coleman because they married in 1938. There was an attraction that took place. She invited him to come and minister. And the lust of the flesh, because we're all fallible. What happened? She was attracted to him. It doesn't say that she was very much attracted to her, but one thing that he did like about Catherine is that she knew how to pack the house and their offerings were very big. She knew inside her own heart that the marriage was a bad idea. Her friends told her that it was a bad idea. The Holy Spirit had been dealing with her against it, but she so desperately decided to step out of the will of God, which weighed heavily on her, 
her world came crashing down. She ultimately gave up her church in Denver, lost some of her closest associates, and the Waltrip's evangelical meetings. Efforts were dogged by the stories of their history, which means they were not very successful. When people know that you are in error and you begin to have meetings, people are not dumb. They recognized it. And because of the history that they found out that she had married this man and they had joined together their ministries. It says that they went before. She went before her own congregation in Denver. And she said, the Lord is connecting these two ministries together. She was being blindsided. And and the thing is that he was probably whispering sweet nothings inside of her ear. See, God was using her mightily. And the enemy will send somebody your way. And when he sent somebody her way, he began to talk these things to her. And here is a woman who wasn't married, who was single, who was in ministry and doing the things of God. And the enemy sent somebody her way to kind of knock her down because God was building something in her life. And what happens is that she became a woman that was so powerful, but because of the lust of the flesh, she became very naive. And it says that the Holy Ghost began to speak to her inside of her spirit. And when the Holy Ghost was talking to her and began to share that this is not the right relationship, she ignored the voice of God and she stepped out into the lust of the flesh. And she stepped out of the will of God where she went behind her congregation and everything that God had done for her in her ministry, everything that God had was building up up to this point. She had built all these different things with the help of God and what God was using, and all of a sudden it came to a screeching halt because of one moment of weakness, one moment of the lust of the flesh. If he did it in the Garden of Eden, he'll do it again. And what happened was she goes before her congregation and he tells, she tells her congregation, you know what, we are going to merge this thing together and two are greater than one and we're going to be strong and we're going to do these things. And it says that her own congregation began to weep and begin to cry because they recognized the naiveness. Here is a woman that was bold. Here is a woman that was different. Here is a woman that was stepping the things of God. Here is a woman whose heart was passionate for the people. And here it is that she had been duped by the devil. Or eventually she gave up her church and she gave up her work. And she went to follow him on the road. And it says that people did not receive them very well. Because just like, you know, rumors begin to spark, it's, it sure is the same in the church as well, too. They'll find out. They knew that he had abandoned his, his, his wife and his children and left to marry Catherine. But the only thing is when the Holy Ghost was speaking to her all this time and telling her this is the wrong thing. It says, out of the, out of the mouth are two or three witnesses. Let the word be established. She didn't agree. Her friends didn't agree. And the Holy Spirit was reminding her that this is not the right relationship with her. But nonetheless, the lust of the flesh became overpowering for her that she was duped and she stepped right in and she lost everything. It says that she ultimately gave up her church in Denver. She lost some of her closest associates and the Waltrip's efforts were dogged by stories of their history. Her life was a disaster. The work Catherine has so diligently built over the previous five years quickly disintegrated. She lost everything that she had worked for by not following the leading of the Lord. It says in 1944, feeling the marriage was the biz, bi, biggest mistake of her life, she left Waltrip. She, he eventually divorced her in 1947. See, the thing is that he never loved her. He loved her money and how she could raise a big crowd. That's what he loved. I want to share with you a statement of what Catherine says about that whole time in her life, that relationship. This is her quote from her life. Catherine shares, shares why she had to leave. She said this. She says, I had to make a choice. Would I serve the man that I loved or the God 
that I loved. I knew I couldn't serve God and live with Mr. No one will ever know the pain of dying like I know it. For I loved him more than I loved life itself. And for a time, I loved him even more than God. I finally told him I had to leave, for God had never released me from my original call. Not only did I live with him, I had to live with my own conscience, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit was almost unbearable. I was trying to justify myself through this marriage. In spite of the looks and the whispers that she received and the wholesale rejection, it took great faith and dog determination to restore Catherine's ministry. You know, she had lost everything. She finally came to a point in her life where she realized it. But not all of us end up there. Not all of us get there. Sometimes we can be blinded for 20 years and never see it. But the Holy Ghost began to speak to her and began to teach her, and began to show her that what she was doing, she was living a lie. Now, the Bible says that God is a jealous God. And the moment that we put somebody else above him, you're not going to get too far. But thank God that her consciousness was open to the voice of the Holy Ghost. Well, she made a decision, and that was decision was to walk away from him and to leave that relationship. And understand, she did that with, with all the different things going against you. For one, you're a female in ministry, and for two, you've now just been divorced. And in the circles that she was running with, those were not seen as good things. Coleman, Coleman began to hold small evangelical meetings. So here it is that she's going back on her way again. But when you honor God, the Bible says that he honors you. If you live for God, God will begin to rise up again inside of you. It says in 1946, she was asked to speak in Franklin, Pennsylvania. She was well received and she decided to stay in the area. Coleman began preaching on radio broadcasts in Oil City, Pennsylvania. These became so popular that they were picked up in Pittsburgh, and she was preaching throughout the area. She began to preach about the healing power of God, and in 1947, a woman was healed of a tumor while listening to Coleman preach. Several Sundays later, a man was also healed while he was teaching, while she was teaching on the Holy Spirit. She was now convinced of God's healing work. See, sometimes we need also need revelation. See, her heart was salvation to bring them in, to get them saved. But she didn't do much study, but she also understood that when she did her study, that the moment that you receive salvation, the moment you receive your healing. And she began to study that. And in her meetings, people were getting healed instantly. If you want to look at some of the meetings, like if you look at Benny Hinn's meeting, Benny Hinn says this a lot of times. He patterns a lot of his ministry after the ways that Catherine Coleman used to have it. So if you see some of Benny Hinn's crusades, that's how Catherine Coleman used to have it. In 1948, Coleman held a series of meetings at Carnegie Hall in Pittsburgh. She eventually left Pennsylvania, and she moved to Pittsburgh in 1950 and continued to hold meetings at Carnegie Hall until 1971. These are probably her best-known years. Her style was flamboyant. She would hold her famous miracle services, and the auditoriums were filled to capacity every time, turning away thousands. God had restored her ministry again, but not after more effort and more work. She was on radio and television shows. She even appeared on the Johnny Carson show. She was ordained in 1968 by the Evangelical Church Alliance and was closely associated with the growing charismatic movement. Hundreds of people were healed in her meetings, 
and reports of people being healed even while listening to her on television and radio. People she prayed for would often be hit with the power of God and fall out under the Spirit. Coleman never claimed that she was the healer. Actually, she kind of really despised, uh, she, she despised the word faith healer. She always wanted to point people to Jesus. It was Jesus that was the healer, not Catherine Coleman. It says the last miracle service of Catherine's ministry was held at the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles, California on November 19th of 1975. As she left the building, an employee in Catherine's Hollywood office saw something she would never forget. As everyone had left the auditorium, Catherine walked quietly to the end of the stage. She raised her head and slowly scanned the balcony as if she was gazing at every seat. Like an eternity, then Catherine dropped her gaze to the second balcony, following every row and every seat with her eyes. Then she looked at the ground floor, studying every seat. I can only imagine what was going on through her mind, the memories, the mighty victories, the healings, the holy laughter. and the tears. Was it possible that Catherine knew that she would never return to the platform? Was it also possible at that moment she said goodbye to her earthly ministry? God had used her mightily. And she would look up through the balcony and she would look at all the things that were happening through her ministry that God had did, won all those victories, all the healings. People being delivered of cancer. Tumors falling off people's bodies. Eyes opening. Ears popping. The healing powers of God moving mightily inside of her meetings. Was this the last time? Is this why she looked at her, at the platforms and the balconies? Was this the last time that she would be on the pulpit? It was said that in 1955, Coleman had been diagnosed with a heart problem. Nevertheless, she kept a very busy schedule, and she overworked herself, especially in the 70s. She traveled back and forth from Pittsburgh to Los Angeles frequently, as well as taking trips around the world. Her heart was very enlarged, and she needed surgery. Now, she was diagnosed earlier in her ministry but at that time she was continuing on to minister she didn't schedule surgery when she overworked herself it says that in 1970 going back and forth and all around the world that her heart began to get enlarged it says in just a little over three weeks from that November date of her looking at the balcony Catherine Coleman lay dying in the Hillcrest Medical Center of Tulsa, Oklahoma after whole open heart surgery, there were some complications that had taken place. It says it is mentioned that a Mr. Oral and Evelyn Roberts were among a few of the visitors permitted to see Catherine in the Hillcrest Medical Center. As they walked into her room and they went to her bedside to pray for her healing, Oral says that when Catherine recognized what they were doing at that moment, because they come there to, to lay hands on her, for God to heal her. But she stuck out her hand like this, as lying on a bed. She stuck out her hand, and she said, she pointed up. Oral Roberts' wife, Evelyn, said, she doesn't want us to pray for, pray for her. She wants to go be with the Lord. Evelyn Roberts told Oral that she didn't want prayers. She wants to go home to be with Jesus. This wonderful red-headed lady who introduced the ministry of the Holy Spirit to our generation and thrilled the hearts of millions finally received her heart's desire. It was said that the Holy Spirit descended upon her one more time as she was laying in that hospital bed. 
the nurse who was attending her, as she was laying there, saw a light that came over her where her face and her body glowed and that the presence of that hospital felt like the presence of God. At 8.20 p.m., Friday, February 20th, 1976, Catherine Coleman went home to be with the Lord. She will always be remembered as a woman who believed in miracles. She was and is one of God's generals. Let's all stand.